What is going on, CyberFam? Today we got a really cool special one. Um, Alex Carp interviewed his one of his senior engineers uh, regarding the AI infl inference platform. I'm actually really excited for this one. This is the stuff that I really, really want to see. It's pretty short, it's about a five minute uh, interview. Now, one more thing guys, before we get started on this, if any of my videos go over like 10 minutes-ish, I'm gonna put chapters in the, uh, in the or sections or whatever in the description so you guys can just skip to sections if you like. Secondly, um, thank you for all my subscribers. I've been like having a crazy amount of subscribers. Subscribe, uh, really appreciate you guys voting with the subscribe button. Really what I'm trying to do here is just be as straight up as I can with the Palantir stuff. Um, you know, I, I do work in, you know, a lot of the tech and deep tech kind of space so I can talk to some of the components. It's important to keep in mind I don't actually work there, right? So everything I tell you is really just based on my excitement. And this is the stuff that I use for my own investment philosophy. I highly recommend you guys do your own research and, uh, you know, take everything that I say as stuff that I would apply for myself and myself only. Okay. Uh, I'm really glad to have you guys along for the ride. So let's get into this right away. All right. Looks like we got it up and running. Let's check it out, guys. Pretty excited on this one. It's finally talking about the AI stuff. It's about damn time, I think. I'll chime in after. It's Kleber. Balladeer. Alex Karp plus Robert Imig. Imig. Here we are in New Hampshire, in the center of the universe, in <laughs> my barn, uh, where so many things have happened. And... Uh, <laughs> First off the bat, let me just get this out of the way. There's been so many videos of like Alex Carp in his barn. It's starting to turn into like the office, like meeting room or something. That's hilarious, man. He's even laughing about it just now. That's pretty cool. That's pretty chill. Like what an awesome company to work for. Like you want to interview or you want to like talk to the CEO real quick, just step into his barn. That's hilarious, man. <laughs> We're talking about some of the stuff you guys are working on. And, um, you know, Palantir has had, um, you know, many iterations where we build products and we have to standardize them because our clients rely on them, especially in the national security context. Each time we have like a cascading uh, thing where you have this maximally creative focus and then it has to be kind of uh, standardized. And you guys are kind of in the beginning of the cascading, chaotic, creative process. Um, so I'm Rob Inig. Uh Software engineer lead, been a Palantir about 10 years. AIP, what's the technical challenge? <laughs> Real quick, it's really funny because uh, whenever they do these videos for, for corporate events, they always try to get like the engineers to be involved. And so we just don't want to be involved in this stuff, right? So you can see like Robert's like his hands are in his pocket, and just like body language is just like, dude, I just wanted to talk to you about something exciting. Why did you have to record this? <laughs> we're actually solving why is it important yeah so the big uh the big change is is shifting compute to the to the edge so instead of okay. bringing your data back into a foundry or a gotham and making your decisions in some ground you know environment or cloud environment um we're actually like moving the logic and moving ai but not only ai also just like transforms physics math but moving that logic out to the edge um to actually run when they mean the edge, by the way, they're talking about like where these things are actually employed, right? Basically the last area of compute before rendering, for example, is basically what they're talking about the edge. And, and the reason this is so hard, and maybe they'll elaborate on this, it's just a five minute video, so I'm gonna try to give as much commentary as possible. But the reason why it's so hard is because you need so much compute power for you to actually draw like, because um, a lot of this is just like you take as many inputs as possible, do some sort of like algorithms to actually use like back propagation to then say, OK, this is possibly what you're going to want or whatever. Right? Or this is possibly what the results are or some kind of desired result um, that takes a lot of compute power. So which is probably what he's alluding to, which is usually you would load into something like Foundry, some sort of like managing platform or middle tier platform. Uh, which does some massaging and moves data around and packages and all this other stuff and then moves it into more, you know, um, categorization or, or some kind of like algorithmic modeling. Um, and then finally, there's there's some end result, right? Whereas this one, it's like, I think what's happening, which is actually really cool if they can do this, is they 
are taking like the final execution piece of it and actually moving that out so that the response time is much faster. There's some, there's definitely trade-offs to this. Everything in IT guys, there's huge trade-offs. Like something might seem good, but then it really depends on the situation that you're trying to employ for because there are multiple of trade-offs, any decision you make. Run on aircraft, on boats, satellites, ground vehicles, go. we've deployed this. And what, what are like moving transforms and logic to the edge? What, why is that difficult? Yeah, so um, no, it's, it's, it's difficult from a technical perspective because you don't have all the, the power of Foundry or a Gotham there. So you have to yeah. figure out how to um, build an engine, per se, that, that can run in these very typically low power, disconnected environments where you don't have good uh -huh. uh, network access. Um, you're usually running on somewhere between 10 and 50 watts is typically where we uh, deploy. Oh. You don't have this big rack of servers, but you have a very small device that has to run all of your code. Um, so we just just to touch on Robert's point here more. Look, every time anyone does something in IT in general, uh, especially from the software side, the power power usage and stuff is very rarely considered because you know you're usually in the cloud or usually in some kind of leverage infrastructure where you're not care you don't care about that you're like obviously assuming that the thing's going to be plugged in right and it's going to have enough power uh, the psu for whatever rack is actually like good and all this other stuff so like you're not worried about that so you don't optimize for that kind of stuff but now when you move stuff over to the edge you're talking about like small devices that use a very specific amount of power to do some specific amount of things right and depending on the importance of this device you might need to write very efficient code for it to actually just do what it needs to and get the hell out right and and i think um like he alluded to this right it's going to be like these uh these these you know equipment and stuff that's in the field like imagine it's like uh like i'm sure this is for the government right so imagine if it's some kind of like a i don't know operative right you're you have only limited amount of resources available in that particular vehicle or in that particular edge right so if you have software that's just draining power or if you have software that's just like using tons of the internet or the small amount of bandwidth that they actually have coming in like you're you're gonna remove and you're gonna thwart all of the other operations that are supposed to happen along the same bandwidth right so you need to write super efficient code this stuff is like really hard guys like from a from an engineering principle, it's like very difficult. There's some really, really, really smart people that probably um, in charge of doing this stuff. Anyway, we've we've been deploying to to these sorts of environments and basically building um, this logic up and building these algorithms up in Foundry. And then once you have confidence there in that algorithm and that model and the way it's performing, then you can push it out to the edge so it can operate completely oh, okay. disconnected in a low latency environment potentially, you know, feeding back into the system so you could have an autonomous uh, platform. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits to that, especially in the defense that we've seen. Yep, yep. And my way of explaining it to outsiders mm -hmm. is you have two problems. One that you have, you know, low energy source, so batteries uh, and not endless supply. And two, that you have to somehow have the semantic layer uh, reduce the complexity to the problems you can solve. Yeah. Is the second problem also real or is that my own, just my imagination? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, is, it is. Yeah, because the, the difficult thing is you have to, you basically have to build the tools that you're going to need in this edge environment and you have to know those before you land there. So you have to know a lot about the sensors that are producing the mm -hmm, data, mm -hmm. what that data looks like and a rough shape of what you want to do to that data so that when you get it in real time, you already oh, have man. what you need. Because in, in Foundry, you can do data integrations. You can get data that you know, looks like whatever and you've, made, you've never seen it before and you have the tools to be able to work with it and to manipulate it into a format that you can make sense of. Um, but, but at the edge, you, you, you kind of have to know that. You, you have to have it structured a little bit more where you can know what that sensor is going to be outputting so like maybe a, right a, 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 a also bastardization lay version would be, you know, in Foundry, we have unlimited supply of power, unlimited ability to integrate the data on the back end. But here we have limited data and de facto you're pre-integrating the data you're allowed to integrate on the right, edge. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we... Wow. Okay. So 
as huge. Okay, so so what that is, what what they're describing, right? Is okay. So for those of you who are familiar with Palantir, you know what Foundry and Gotham and all these things are, right? They're they're massive platforms, but the thing is, like, there are things that are running in the back, as well as exposing to the front that do so much with the data sets that are being provided. Um, the thing is, what's happening here and what they're describing is. And this is the trade-off, right? This is the trade-off. There's a series of like assumptions that you're going to have to make for you to push this out to the edge. You guys understand what I'm saying? So like these engines that he was describing, right? They take into consideration the unit that it's being deployed to. So, right. So if it's like, uh, he mentioned defense. So if it's like in a tank or something, right? It needs to be aware of all the sensors that are going to be feeding into the system, right? As well as all the other external sensors and external things that are being paired into this thing. All, and on top of that, this is this is AI inference, which means that there's what they're talking about actually is a modeling, right? So it's like um, they have potentially modeled this somewhere else outside of the edge, right? Outside of like where it's supposed to be in the edge, and then made some assumptions and then toss it into the edge so that when it's in the edge, it can function autonomously. You guys see what I'm saying? There's a problem with that. The trade-off is it's not connected really. And it's not like exactly, um, you know, it's not given everything it possibly can for it to do its thing. Right. So it's not like uh, a full rack of compute power to just kind of do whatever it needs to. So it does a very specific type of thing and it should be doing that very well and very efficiently. So that's actually pretty powerful because for you to get here, you need to actually have a bunch of stuff trained and validated, which means that when you do train it, it's actually giving you the results that you want for all the sensors and everything that's coming in. So like there is a lot of trial and error here that must have happened in the past. Right. So there's these things like uh, like when you when you when you train your algorithms, you have to like set all of these parameters like epochs and all this other stuff. So when you're actually training it, like it's it takes weeks, sometimes months, sometimes even like, you know, quarters, like entire quarters for you to train just a single set of like algorithms. And you want to make sure that the data set is sound and all this other stuff. So it's if they're pushing some stuff out to the edge, then they're very confident in the assumptions that they're making, that the models are going to reflect the results that are desired right now. Real real world situation, we don't know, because these are all like stuff that's behind the wall garden. Right. So we're just all speculating here. But the fact that they're able to push this out to the edge and actually have it operate there with a very like pseudo AI kind of way is actually kind of big. Like, I got to believe this isn't just like a if and else like function block. Right. This has got to be something a little more complicated, uh, more low level. So it uses less battery, but it's not battery uses less power. But at the same time, efficient enough for it actually be able to, you know, perform in a fast way. So it has to be some kind of trained model combined with like some uh, some middle tier that actually goes in. Um, you know, does like the business logic and that kind of stuff, right? Because the thing is, guys, like typically here's how these things kind of work, okay? Like for you to have some sort of front end or, you know, uh, like a layer that's exposed to the people that are actually inputting the values or something that's inputting the values, you have a separate side of it, usually like some kind of web server or whatever that hosts the application that's actually, you know, presenting you with something or the presentation layer. After these things come in, there's another step, right? And, and guys, I'm totally dumbing this down, okay? But basically, after that, there's another step. And this step is where it transfers some of this data into the host or any place that these algorithms actually are run. Now, most of the time, once you train these algorithms, you can actually expose them as APIs or you can expose them as functions that can be used to give you the result based on inputs. Okay. So this is actually separated. These things are taken up and put, usually put into the cloud, things like GCFs and, you know, other sort of, uh, um, you know, applications within the cloud or some kind of, uh, infrastructure itself that sends back results based on input. The thing is they've taken all of this stuff and compressed and compounded it into like one thing, right? So, you gotta, you gotta believe that the side that takes in the input is actually looking for very specific kinds of input and it's trained specifically to give a, a narrow range of results. Do you see what I'm saying? So, uh, that's most likely what this is. Um, they've taken multiple layers of like the OSI model and like you basically squished it all into one. Um, so in a way you've now everything's gone to microservices, but instead of doing microservices, you've built like a very small monolith and made it into a program and stuck it into an edge. I think that's what's happening here, but you know, I don't know. Um, but yeah, this is, it's, it's pretty, it speaks to their level of expertise for them to be able to push this out. It's a pretty confident move to be honest with you. So, um, it's actually quite hard guys. It's quite hard. It's like, 
you know, they have to be so confident for them to push this out there. Especially, I mean, they're doing it all in training situations. He just said it was in like, he came back from a training exercise or something. So, um, but for them to be even like suggesting this stuff is like really, really crazy. Um, it's like having like a Jarvis with you. Like imagine you're like a tank driver and you have like Jarvis in your tank or something, right? like a mini Jarvis. Um, anyway, but, but this whole sensor stuff is actually pretty cool too, because I got to tell you, I did a, I did a hackathon like five years ago or four years ago was shout out to my, uh, Indianapolis hackathon team. We, we went to this hackathon for, uh, uh, fire and safety or something like that, where we had to do like a bunch of sensor stuff. It's tough, man. It's not easy. Like we were using stuff like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, but to be honest, like a lot of these sensor data that come in, it's a lot of gibberish. Like you have to do a lot of patching together with the code, right? It's not just simple. And, and this, I'm talking about basic sensors. These guys are dealing with like, you know, um, military sensors and all this other stuff. God only knows what kind of like, you know, arbitrary information that those things provide. Right. And governments and military have a tendency to ask for literally everything. So these sensors will provide like quite verbose amounts of data. Um, so the models that are being put into the edge, not only do they have to be small, not only do they have to be efficient, not only do they have to be like really fast and all this other stuff, they also have to take in like a like a, <laughs> a butt ton of data and actually do all of those things that I just mentioned within like a smaller scope and also let other things share the um, you know, the compute power and stuff like that. So I don't know, man, it sounds pretty good to me. It's crazy stuff. Let's keep going. We just, so we just got back from project convergence, big army exercise, yeah. um, out in the deserts of Arizona where, where we were installing this software on a bunch of different aircraft, unmanned systems and, and manned aircraft and helicopters. And there's a big team, big How development team. How many people are on the us. team? The dev team now is probably 10 to 15 engineers. Oh, that's um, it? Including wow. Actually, this could make sense. Uh, 10 to 15 is pretty small in my opinion, but where it would make sense is if they're actually at a stage where, for example, they just need to deploy and test um, and the actual like, you know, product product development has been finished, in which, me, in which case, like this team is probably like, there's like a lot more engineers that were there before that uh, had moved on to other projects. So now these engineers are essentially there to do like day day one, day two operations, which is product is created, deploy it, maintain it, test it, right? That kind of stuff. A couple project product managers. One of the things we were talking about before that is definitely not, like you have things that are true and believed, but you also have some things that are true and not believed. Uh, one, of the thing, one of the things I believe is true and not generally believed is that the government isn't advancing whatever you want to call AI, but certainly whatever you want to call what we're discussing here. So my version of it is it's a little less AI. It's more managing the integration and the transforms and the logic under the conditions that are we're under on the at the edge. Here's Wait, the what? Hold on, hold on. Sorry, guys, one sec. All right, the team. Things we were talking about before that is definitely not like you have things that are true and believed, but you also have some things that are true and not believed. Uh, one, of the thing, one of the things I believe is true and not generally believed is that the government isn't advancing whatever you wanna call AI, but certainly whatever you wanna call what we're discussing here. So my version of it is it's a little less AI, it's more managing the integration and the transforms and the logic oh, okay. under the conditions that are, we're under on the, at the edge. Here's the Palantir's future. Okay. Um... Yeah, there's, okay, so what he's talking about is like, in my other uh, technical videos, I did bring up the whole integration bit. I, I love to use that word, right? Because it's true. There's a lot of IT in general and, and software in general is like a ton of just randomly different stuff that need to talk to each other. So with that being said, I like how, I really like how Alex Karp says, oh, like AI or whatever this is. Like it's, it's to be honest, it's not exactly AI, right? Like it is an inference. If they're calling it platform, but it's more of like an engine, right? Inference engines. Um, so he's, t he's saying all the integrations that we provide with things like Foundry and all this other stuff, right? You're taking like a part of that and you're modeling it to a smaller level with something very specific, things like what sensors you need. So like you take all the variables that you would normally have uh, to infer from in Foundry and all that stuff, right? But you're catering it to a more narrow view uh, for something like a tank or whatever, like this kind of exercise. And then you're running like multiple stages of training and stuff on that particular model. 
and then passing more integrations along the line. And then the end result ends up being something that's super catered to whatever this is, this whatever your edge is, right? So that's what he's saying in terms of like doing the integration. And it's not exactly AI because, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a dumb AI. It's not exactly smart intelligence. It might not be as dynamic as you would like it to be for, for something like a foundry or something, right? But it is something that's very catered to what that edge is. So for everything that that, that particular edge would have to execute, it can come up with the inferences from that, right? So that's, that's pretty important. Uh, that's probably what he's living to there. Future. Yeah, thank you. Oh, what the heck? Hold on. What the heck was that? The edge. Here's the pound. Here's future. Yeah, thank you. What? What was that, man? Oh my god. Why do they do this? It's like that was such a good interview. Continue. Like anyway, whatever. Um that sucks. Like that's the stuff that I really I that's what I'm investing for, right? Like we want to know all the the edge AI stuff and all this other stuff that they're doing. Um I don't know. Anyway, that was cool. Like I think I think I talked about that enough. But the thing is guys like for me my, my own personal view about, on this is like palantir has is is fle is like flexing a lot right they're like look at this look at that look at that hyper auto blah 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 most of the stuff that i've looked at maybe with the exception of like gotham um has been and, and foundry foundry is great but hyper auto and stuff like they're com they're putting out software in spaces that other people already have software but it's like much better than them, right? So right now, there's a lot of stuff in Palantir that's like, oh, here's this. It's a hundred times better than this, right? They are in a league of their own when it comes to this stuff that we just saw. But we need more of this. Like, I really wish that they would display more of this. But I have a feeling they're not doing it because it's still sitting as a pseudo under Gotham or like you know, in one of their government stuff, which they can't really show us, right? Man, that's like really cool. Like the way that they move their models into the edge and if it actually does what they need to do is like a game changer that's like i yeah that would be a huge advantage in the battlefield i, I would have to assume that right um and of course it's it being palantir whatever they learn from here they'll move it over to like a consumer or a consumer um you know like private enterprise model or something so it's something to do with like enterprise that's really cool anyway guys um that's it like I really wish they started displaying more of this stuff because like, I mean, Hyper Auto is great, but we have ERP solutions right now, right? They're not as good as Hyper Auto, most likely, but like, I mean, <laughs> I would rather find out about this because in this stuff, they are literally in a class of their own. So, um, a bit of sweet on that, but you guys let me know what you think. Um, feel free to hit me up in the comment section below. I think this is really, really cool. Super promising. Finally, they released a video on this kind of stuff. They need needed to do this. I really wish they did like more of a bigger demo. If you guys know of one, feel free to shoot it my way. I'll take a look at it. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.